There have been many wars over the years during the cyberpunk timeline, and all have shaped the different countries and the world as a whole, and honestly shaped it for the worst. From the Central American conflicts between most of the Southern American countries and the United States, to the corporate wars where they would fight to gain land and resources for their profit, or even the many many gang wars all over the different cities. All of these conflicts developed long lasting relationships and threw the world into a time of serious hostility, especially within America itself, which was tearing itself apart ever since the events of Y2K and even before that. For a while the new United States after the 2000s would be relatively the same, with the federal government being located within Washington DC. However the big difference was that there now existed a few free states that would hold different ideas compared to the federal states of the country. These free states consisted within the Pacific Confederation, the Western States and the Republic of Texas, with Night City holding its own beliefs as well. For a time this worked out well for the people, especially after everything they had been through for the past few decades. However, a new president named Rosalind Myers would want to change that in an attempt to bring together all of the states into the NUSA. This would not sit right with all of the free states as they felt they would lose their own identity from this, and because of that, this would go on to trigger the next war in the cyberpunk timeline, named the Unification War, between the years of 2069 and 2070. So what was the Unification War? What was the response from the free states? What happened within the war? And what was the final outcome? Well in today's video we will be explaining one of the most influential wars within the cyberpunk timeline, and explain how it affected the whole 2077 timeline and events to come in the future. This is the story behind the heavily influential Unification War of Cyberpunk. story begins within the early 2000s, where the United States had just suffered an embarrassing defeat that was an utter disaster within the Second Central American War. This embarrassment led to a major reform in its policies and also triggered the hit back against the group known as the Gang of Four, essentially a political cabal composed of NSA, CIA, FBI and DEA, who would be targeted by the Army and CIA in a counter coup. As a result of this, the whole all of Washington DC was filled with military troops fighting back against the gang, with most of the army and CIA troops winning and taking back control. However, saying that, many of the elements of the gang were not fully eliminated for another four years, with most of the remnants of them joining the high ranks of the corporations who were quickly taking over the world. With the gang now out of federal government, the people of the United States tried desperately to restore democracy. However, this would not last long as the presidential appointee, Henry Jacoby, would go on to be assassinated in November 2005. An investigation quickly came to light with evidence pointing directly to the Mantoga Inc Corporation, who were then given an ultimatum to leave the United States or suffer the consequences. The corporation didn't listen however, and as a result of the corporation refusing to leave, the United States military would completely destroy them in the event known as Operation Big Stick, also known as as the Mantoga incident after all of it. Things didn't stop there as more events took place within the space station known as the Crystal Palace as US backed terrorists aimed to take it over in 2009 and in 2012 the city of Chicago was hit with a bio plague which went on to kill over 1,700 people, leaving the city in ruins. Because of these trying times, individual states disliked what the government were doing and felt like they could benefit from running things themselves. Immediately some states started to do that and broke away from the main body of the country. The first to do so was North California, which was then followed by the South at a later date. The next to follow suit was Texas, Oregon, Washington, and finally North and South Dakota. Splitting from the federal government, these states would go on to label themselves as the free states and would go on to set their own laws, trade agreements, and most importantly, no longer send their taxes to Washington DC. 
By the year of around 2022 and 23, when the corporate war was coming to an end, the new United States was officially not a superpower any longer, under the leadership of their firm, brutal president, who was the once ex-president of Militech, President Elizabeth Cress. During this time, local elections were still going on. However, national elections would not be a thing, as the free states did not want to get involved in that specific type of politics. It would only be in later years where a treaty would be signed between the free states and the Washington DC government, when national elections would become a thing once again. Eventually, the new United States operated similarly to the United States of the late 19th century, where the government was based in Washington DC and controlled the civilized East Coast and governing the Boswash Corridor. However, when it got to the Mississippi River, the federal government had no power at all, as that was all run by what they considered the Wild West. The year was now 2069 and a new president was to be elected who had beaten the long-serving Elizabeth Cress. This president was to be Rosalind Myers and almost immediately on being elected, Myers suggested a way to finally bring an end to this separation of the government and the free states and suggested that they both end their petty feuds and unify into one strong nation once again. This would be labelled as the unification program and something Myers was extremely proud of. However, this did not go down well at all with all of the other free states, believing they were going to be taken by force and lose all of their identities. Because of this response, it was almost inevitable that conflict was going to ensue and the new United States of America was going to be plunged into yet another war. With no budging from the free states, the nationalized Militech forces as well as the former free states of Southern California and Utah would go on to declare war on the free states of Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, Montana, Arizona, Nevada, and Northern California. As for the states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, they would remain completely neutral in the conflict at the price of making some concessions to the federal government. The Republic of Texas didn't side with the NUSA or join the alliance either. Instead, it wanted its own society and rules, and because of that, opposed both of the warring sides. Out within the United States, there were other free states that would have joined the fight against the government. However, because of how brutal the NUSA forces were, they were able to take over these free states relatively quickly, catching them by complete surprise, and because of that, found themselves with only one option, and that was to just surrender to them. The war had now officially begun, and the states of Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, Montana, and Arizona were the first to be hit by the new United States military with the help of South California and Utah. There was to be no stopping of their march to try and make the United States unified once again and eventually turn them into a superpower once more. After the Fourth Corporate War, Arasaka had been thrown out of the country due to the nuke incident within Night City. Being a national enemy, any involvement with Arasaka was seen as criminal, and this was helped even further with the fact that Militech, who was their main opponent during the Corporate War, had now become the national army for the American government. However, during the mid pass of the unification conflict, behind the backs of the federal government and the NUSA military, Arasaka would go on to fund the free states in their efforts to try try and re-establish its influence on North America. This new influx of money and resources from this giant Japanese corporation massively helped all of the free states as it provided them with the latest weaponry and technology throughout all of the lands, as well as corporate security advisors who could help them with their fight. But despite all of those new things, the NUSA military was still as powerful as ever as they also had Militech's most advanced technology and were getting resources and back up from all of the rest of the federal states. With this progression in the war, conflicts kept escalating by the day, which would lead to the Battle of Ridgecrest within California, which became known at the time as the bloodiest conflict the war had seen so far, with over 3,070 people reported being dead within just one day. Sadly for the free states, the federal states and their national military was just too much for them to handle, as most of them fell to the federal forces, all except two those being Texas and Northern California. But of course, the federal troops weren't going to let them get away easily as they were going to carpet bomb the city of Sacramento.
Sacramento during the peak of the NUSA conflicts, killing many innocents and free state troops once again, angering both Texas and Northern California as they saw there was no stopping the government from doing whatever they wanted. By this point in the war, the Northern Californian city of Night City, which had been on the border of the NUSA allied South California or SoCal, had completely avoided all of the conflicts of this unification war so far. The reason was that its internal government wanted to make it so it held a completely neutral perspective on anything going on within the country as a whole. However, this wasn't always an easy task. Seeing the war happening all around them, the citizens of Night City knew it was only a matter of time before the federal troops would be emerging on their doorsteps, taking over the city or carpet bombing them like they had with Sacramento. Because of this fear that was running throughout all of the city, corporations were the first to make it clear that being in this location was a bad idea, as the corporations would start to pull out all of their funding from the ongoing development of the Pacifica district, which was set out to be made into the most luxury resort you could ever go to, with amazing hotels, swimming pools, amusement parks, and great views out onto the ocean and of their fantastic neon city. Things got so bad for the people of Night City who had only just rebuilt from the horrifying red years after the new king of Arasaka Tower, and now with the threat of war on their doorsteps and corporations pulling out all of their funding, the USSR, who was still functional at this time and supporting any party going against the federal government of the NUSA, sent humanitarian help to the people, with many independent observers claiming that this humanitarian help wasn't food and resources, but instead was truckloads of weapons. It didn't take long after that before citizens started having the same idea as the corporations and started to leave the city in droves, trying to seek assistance and to take refuge within Texas. However, as they left the city and headed towards the east, they were going to find that the border to Texas was officially closed and they were forced to turn back and go back to Night City. But things were heating up even more and eventually a NUSA army division was suddenly spotted approaching Night City's outskirts. It really looked like all hope was lost during this point in time, and there was nothing that could save them here. However, the people of Night City were in luck, as their extremely experienced councilman of the time, Lucius Ryan, was able to use his contacts that he had gathered during his time in the Night City Council, and would go on to ask the exiled Arasaka Corporation for their protection. Despite all of the laws against Arasaka coming back to the NUSA, they did accept the call for help from the free states of Northern California and more specifically, Night City, as they would set sail and show up in their supercarrier at the Del Coronado Bay. As this supercarrier arrived, it took a few hours for the NUSA army to realize that there was nothing they could do in this instance against the mighty force of Arasaka, who could wipe them out easily and also involve them in the war if they were to continue on with their attack on Night City. And with all of this information in front of them, the federal government would go on to retreat from the area, save Night City from being taken over completely. But this intervention of Arasaka now raised a problem. Clearly the free states would have their backing, but for the NUSA if they were to continue down this path of trying to take North California and Texas, they would have to fight against the troops of Arasaka. And that would almost certainly mean another grand scale war, essentially the fifth corporate war between the nationalized Militech and federal government troops against the remaining free states Arasaka and and most likely the USSR. But Arasaka also did not want a full-scale war, as they too were just still getting over the events of 2023 and were rebuilding their corporation's relations. No one could afford things to escalate any further, and because of this, a peace treaty was put on the table. President Myers quickly signed the agreement in Arvin, South California, as it would go on to be named as the Arvin Accord, otherwise known as the Treaty of Unification. And with that all signed, the war was now over despite tensions being at an all-time high. With this treaty, the free states were guaranteed to remain autonomous. However, with that said, they had to cooperate with the new United States, helping out and participating within the federal government, as well as laying down all arms against the federal troops. Ninth City, however, was the one exception, as it was able to completely keep all of its freedoms, as it would go on to break away from the laws and governance of its state of North California, as well as all of the rules and governance 
governance of the NUSA as well. Ninth City was officially labeled as its own unique international free city. But on top of that, Texas also did not participate in the Treaty of Unification, as it was still to this day be a hostile state for the NUSA, who opposed everything the rest of America did. But there was one faction who benefited the most from this whole war and the treaty, and that was the Corporation of Arasaka. For years they had been trying to get back into the North American market, and now with this treaty signed for peace due to their involvement at the end, their ban had now been fully lifted as the corporation started making tracks in North America once again. With all of that said, none, apart from Arasaka and maybe Night City, seem overly happy with the treaty and what it offered their states and ambitions. However, most still agreed that they'd rather take this hardship than once again be plunged into another world war with corporate militaries fighting each other once again. Walking away from the treaty talks with it all settled, all of the free states, corporations and militaries claimed that they had in fact won the war despite it ending in what was ultimately a stalemate. The free states were adamant that they had fought back for their freedom and because of their ultimate bravery they had acquired just that. Whereas the NUSA stated that they were one step closer at achieving their ultimate goal of bringing back everyone into a fully unified nation. It wasn't long before they were going to be that superpower that they once were back in the day. For Night City, despite being a fully independent international city, free from the rule of the American government, their new issue was the fact that corporations were flooding into their city borders, asserting control within certain areas. This massively affected the way the city was run, with corporations pumping millions, if not billions, into the way the city ran its politics, its architecture, and the way people lived. Whilst this influence was worrying for many of the people that lived there, the city did get a massive influx of funding pumped into it to help it rebuild and grow, as the metropolis would be heavily revitalized to make it stand out as an attractive place to be within the west coast. This was all evident within the same year as the treaty being signed, as their newly elected mayor, Lucius Rhine, as well as the city council, allowed Arasaka to build their brand new American headquarters within the corporate plaza, which was on the site that it once stood back in 2023, before it had been blown up by Militech and their operation within the fourth corporate war. But now that North America had gone back to a sort of normality with peace running throughout all of the lands, a huge concrete border wall stood between the border of the North and South Californian states, which was built by the NUSA government to make sure everyone knew their place. For Night City, the NUSA still regarded them as part of the North Californian state, and because of that, the border of the state was extended through the Badlands south of the Neon City. Despite being a pretty small war, the Unification War had dramatic effects on the North American area. It did see thousands of people die due to the bombing runs and battles launched by the NUSA government, and both for the corporations of Arasaka and Militech, they were going to lose billions of euro dollars in military equipment, with Militech losing their own boots on the ground troops and vehicles, and Arasaka in weapons and technology, all then to have the war end in a stalemate. Whilst Arasaka were able to once again come back into the North American region to set up their corporate HQ once again, many would be upset that this war had happened and that they couldn't claim ultimate victory, only lying about the outcome to their public. For Night City, this is a core piece of their history, as it allowed them to write a new chapter, helping them to become an international city, free from the rule of all of the parties and governments around them. However, this came at a price, as it meant the whole city was ruled by the corporation and whatever they wanted the city to be, they would make it so, as is shown through the corporate plaza, where both the giant Arasaka and Militech buildings stand opposing each other in a real power battle. From January 2069 till June 2070, the Unification War took many lives and shaped the future of the country. But with Texas still being a hostile state and none of the parties happy with the outcome of the treaty, is it only a matter of time before the conflict rages again, even if it does mean a global conflict. Only time can really tell. But knowing the corporations, they will do anything to make sure they can acquire more eddies and land to expand their empires. But for now, this has been the story of the wars that shaped North America into what it is today. This has been the story of the Unification War.
to say a huge thank you for watching this video and a massive thank you to my patrons for allowing me to make them on a regular basis, including my small fishes, my big fishes, Christopher, last persona user, Arto Krem, and our new guy, Greg, my YouTube channel, Wise Ones, Fiery Italian, Ico the Wolf, and Sith Lord 906, my sharks, Wow well, Such Gaming, Jason X117, Breadbeard, and our new guy, Ronda C, I hope I said that right, and my Megalodons, Sinus, Hazy Thoughts, and Chernobyl Stalker. But that is all for now. Thank you for watching again. And if you want more lore videos like this one, check out my playlist below. And please do leave a like, comment, and subscribe to help get these videos out there. And with all that said, I shall see you all in the next one. Cheers.